at least 1.7 million troopers. Hey, what? Interesting. We a, did he? Can we do a, we do a frame He missed. And yeah. he responds like a sentient being. He shouldn't have a master. He should be an independent person. Real low, like, like touching sand. Do we take care of this broken teenager? Or do we just recruit her and use her and or, spit her back out again? I mean... A gaslight to save the galaxy? Today we're watching Star Wars Episode 7, that is The Force Awakens. Tell me what you think about this episode. Uh, Star Wars Episode 7, I give it a 7 out of 10, which is actually a high score for me, considering there was tons of problems in the entire movie. There was logic problems, there was combat problems, there was character problems, coincidence problems. But I was kind of enjoying just watching Star Wars with the acting and the music and the sound, and I was enjoying the moment. So I'd bump it up to a 7 out of 10. So generally I felt pretty pretty good watching it. But I think that was mostly based around production values. When I started thinking about things, uh, oh yeah, it just felt, gosh, it's a copycat of episode 4, which is a real problem. They just sort of went bigger and did the exact same thing. It felt kind of, what's the word, contrived? I don't know. It just doesn't make sense in the universe. Um, it does set up the next movies well. It's not a complete disaster. So, like, if the follow-on movies were excellent, I think this would be seen as, like, a lazy introduction to the Disney trilogy. Um, but it still feels like Star Wars. Everyone's happy. Um, there's a lot of unfulfilled plot points. So I'd say, overall, I felt pretty good watching it. Felt like a Star Wars movie. It's overly safe. So 7 out of 10 for me. What do you think? I give it a 5. Five out of Oof. ten. Oof. Yeah, and, and I okay. So some some people are Star Trek, Star Wars. I like them both. I guess I like Star Trek more, but I, I really I really do like them both. However, there's there's lots of problems with this one. Um. So but but first first let's do for pros. Star Wars. Star Wars is always a good time. I mean, I watch everything with Star Wars because it's it's wizards in space, like it's super fantasy. It's the nerd fantasy just left and right. Um. A good pro about this is that Ray and Finn, they're set up to be this duo. Like I really, I really wanted them to both be force sensitive. And maybe not maybe they're not individually better than Kylo Ren, but together their their powers combined, they they can attack from both. I, I thought it was gonna be such a good setup for for Finn to be a Jedi as well. Um another good pro about this is the drama. The drama is very good. And so what, what do I mean by this? Um there are large stakes. So it really feels like like this is a big empire, and the rebel, the rebels are fighting for something substantial, and and then Kylo Ren has to kill Han Solo. Um, it's just fantastic, fantastic, like twist and like stab in your side, and you want Han Solo to live, but you also see from Kylo Ren's perspective, he, he needs to do this in order to ascend in his Sithness. Um, fantastic drama. Um, the cons is one con is fin is Captain Phasma. Like, what is what was why? Like, why why was this character special? Like, they clearly had this silver armor, super tall woman, but then also nothing came of it. So so it's like it was like here's a teaser, something's gonna happen, nothing happens. Um, the second problem that I saw was was Ray's knowledge of the Force. It's it's we've seen so much in Star Wars in the first six episodes that the Force is not something you get for free. Like, you really have to earn it and it's not just something like i can do a bunch of push-ups and now i'm jacked and, and have the force breath. like no, no no it's like a it's like a mental psychological spiritual you really have to like understand yourself and the universe and the world and how the, the living force and and she somehow just gets it um good natural talent but also it feels like it cheapens the value of the force it's just people can just, just be good at it somehow and then also who and what is snook um why is he gigantic? <laughs> like, what is, what, is, what is going on there? Um, yeah, so, so cons is that, is that some things are just thrown at you and just fizzle out. Don't know why. But uh, so let's watch it and let's discuss it. There are some cool stuff and some weird stuff. Let's just talk about it all. Okay, so the first thing, right in the opening scene, we inter we're introduced to Kylo Ren and an older gentleman. I forgot what his significance is, but, but oh boy, their conversation, I would be just, I would be livid. It's just so much crosstalk. Look how old you've become. Something far worse has happened to you. You know what I've come for. I know where you come from before you called yourself <laughs> Kylo Ren. Like, please, like, like Kylo Ren's like landing on this planet and is like, please, like, I'm going to ask him some questions. We're going to get some answers. And like, he just won't answer my question. Like, like they're just fully two separate conversations. To Skywalker. We know you found it. 
And now you're going to give it to the First Order. The First Order rose from the dark side. You did not. I'll sh <laughs> I didn't ask you for a history lesson. Like, <laughs> like I know the First Order came of the dark side. Look at, look at me. I'm wearing dark side stuff. Do you the dark side? You may try. Cannot deny the truth is your family. <laughs> Turned into Fast and the Furious all of a sudden. Fam it's all about family. Family. I would just be so frustrated having this conversation from either side. Like, yeah. neither of them are actually talking to each other. Well, I always figured that the old guy was resisting. This is his form of resistance. He can't physically resist. He's not so strong in the force or whatever he is. So his form of resistance is to just answer questions with questions. Yep. Yep. I mean, that'll do it. It's just, oh, it's just so frustrating. Like, please, like, please just, I want to have an actual conversation with you. It, rem it reminds me of that one scene in Parks and Rec where Ron Swanson asks, is answering questions from like a federal prosecutor or something. And he answers every question with a question until they give up. <laughs> yeah. 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 So frustrating. Subtle form of resistance. Yeah. I mean, it's legit. So frustrating. Okay. And then we learn Finn's name, his serial number before he's a uh, Finn. Let's listen to it. Hey, what's your name? FN2187. What? FN2187. FN2187. That's the only name they ever gave me. Mm -hmm. So I thought about this FN2187 like that's his serial number, right? So can we figure out from any information from that from that number? So this is what my thoughts were. So you're thinking in terms of there's six numbers and two letters There are, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, two letters and four numbers, but yeah, yeah, yeah. what did exactly. I say? What did you I said say? Six numbers. You said six. Uh, I, six I know what you so yeah, so four numbers ahead. four numbers two letters and from that we can figure out maybe how many potential stormtroopers there are exactly okay because yeah so um his number here yep. oh, let's center it up his number here is fn2187 yep. and so that i i figured here's here's two alphanumeric right yep and so here's here's the first trooper aa0000 yeah, makes sense to me okay if we go through a that well, it's 10,000 so if we go through nine 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 and we get one more then we go back to zero and we roll over this digit so that's 10,000. Mm -hmm. Let's do the same thing. So actually, if you went That through... actually might be 10,001, but it's, it's not important. <laughs> that's cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. okay. So, so <laughs> you're, you're that guy when the professor's giving a lecture, you're like, yeah. actually, professor. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Missing the point. Okay. <laughs> so if we, if we have 10,000 people, troopers, we get one increment here. Mm -hmm. If we do that 26 times, because there's 26 letters in the oh. English alphabet, and I'm pretty sure the. I'm pretty sure the first order uses the English alphabet. Yep. And we increment, we get back to A and we increment B, uh, the first mm -hmm. digit, one place. And so that's 26 times 10,000. Yep. All right, so let's put this all together. FN2187, that's the yep. sixth letter, F, yep. the 14th letter, N, yep. and then 2187. So let's, uh, let's break this down into digits, just, just multiplying by however many there are. So, so mm -hmm. six times 26,000 plus... Yep. 14 times 10,000 plus 2187. That means Finn is the 1,700,000. He's this trooper, yep. um, which means that there's at least 1.7 million troopers. There yep. could be more after him, but but at least that's, he's he, I mean, he's active right now. So it's like a, kind of a, some, that's some type of ballpark. It's, um, a, which, it's kind of interesting in because in, in the modern world, I think when we give out serial numbers, we use a string of letters and digits that are super long that it's so large that we're essentially assigning random numbers to different things. So yeah. you couldn't figure out how many things there are based on the size, but this number is pretty small. So it sounds right. like they're just counting. Yeah, and it's kind of reasonable maybe because the First Order is a new-ish institution, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it can't be more than 20 years old because um, yeah. because of how old Han and Leia are. Yep. And what I, yeah, so, so the maximum possible army that they could use with this serial numbers is only about 7 million. Right. Um, so the first order is pretty, pretty lean. So do you think, so yeah, 7 million is wildly inadequate for galaxy multi-planet situations. Exactly. So this must be like one garrison? Oh. Is, it's the first order just this small. You're saying that there could be an FN2187 at a different location because this oh, is gosh. his his yeah. number for Starkiller Base. For Starkiller Base. Oof. 
So oh. I, I, I'm going to say no, mm -hmm. because then you need to have another identifier. You could have like star S, SKB, star killer base, and then FN2187. But if you don't have that, then if you ever shipped troops around, if like if like half Gosh, of one yeah. regiment died, half another regiment, you combined people, then your serial numbers are all messed up. Right. Now you got to like all your forms now have this shortened version, but now yeah. you got to convert all your forms to the longer version. And some of the forms don't get updated and you got all this crosstalk and who's who. Yeah. Yep. So I'm starting to agree that maybe they just are 7 million big or at least or at most at, at most. At maximum, this this is the at least one point seven because they because FN two one eight seven exists at maximum seven million. But I, I guess I guess if they, if they ever get to the point where they're seven million, they can just add another letter out here. That's true, that's yeah. true. And I guess it also means that when they first made the serial number system, they expected no more than seven million. That seemed like a large number to them at the time. Yeah, yeah. Because normally you put this like these buffer digits in. Right. Why so, Why not just plan three more digits out here? Yeah. Maybe the first anyway. order is small. How did they build Starkiller Base if without few people? It's huge. We'll talk about yeah, that. We'll I, talk I, have about no <laughs> I have no idea. Ah, so this, this is, is a picture Jakku. of Jakku. Mm. And this is, I guess they've captured Poe and their, uh, Kylo Ren is leaving in his cool shuttle thing. Uh, looking at Jakku, I see an impact crater right there. With mm. I don't know what this, this these ejecta is called. This like spider looking thing these guys and because this impact crater still exists and hasn't been eroded away kind of makes it looks like the surface of mars i see that which means low erosion rates mm. Mm -hmm. which means mm -hmm. jakku is really inhospitable to life yet it has moisture in the atmosphere nitrogen oxygen atmosphere no oceans to help facilitate the oxygen atmosphere which as far as i understand on earth the oxygen is mostly made in the oceans um, so maybe Jakku has been terraformed or maybe it mm. was terraformed and then they left. Cause I remember on Tatooine in some of the games, there was like large corporations on Tatooine and they left and now it's just desert. Oh, now it's wastelandy. I see. Yeah. You, so you're saying, you're saying that if there was a planet that was more, that was like naturally hospitable to humans, mm -hmm. then you would have things like water around and oxygen and wind. Yeah. And, and so you wouldn't get things left over like this. Like you wouldn't get impact craters left over in in seemingly pristine condition yeah. and because it would get eroded away by whatever weather. And so, but the fact that this is here tells us something about that the planet isn't naturally hospitable to humans, Yeah. but, but clearly there are people living there. So maybe it's terraformed. Maybe it's terraformed. So maybe there is a lot of back history of Jakku that could be explored in the extended universe. Let's go back also, to Jakku. Yeah. Also, no oceans. That's a big one for me. Even if it is a desert planet, the fact that there's no oceans means I don't know if the atmosphere can be nitrogen, oxygen. So I don't know. Unless but, it's like magically dialed in to just the right amount of oxygen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I guess what oxygen has to be constantly replenished over geologic because, time because it's so reactive. Oh, good point. So it's so, okay. Let's okay. So on the short scale, the humans or whatever there are breathing in and converting carbon dioxide. Yeah. So you're always losing some oxygen. Yeah. But you're saying on geological scales, oxygen is reactive with rock. So so you'll yeah. take like say if you had some some iron around. Yeah. Uh, or in, even in the form of steel, where it's iron and carbon and and mm -hmm. um, chromium, right? chrome, and then and then oxygen will get grabbed up and it gets turned into rust. So yeah. oxygen is disappearing all the time because it gets absorbed into stuff. Yeah, because it's so reactive. Yeah. Mm. So could could be an interesting backstory of Jakku based on this one asteroid crater. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe it was terraformed and filled with some oh, some O2, some breathable oxygen. Mm -hmm. And then when it was abandoned, there's just a timeline. There's, there's, a, there's a time limit on this planet. And people are living here yeah. for a while, but it's... Yeah. Unless it's continually terraformed. Right. And then this. Um, so this, I guess, now that I'm thinking about it, if Jakku is an important place, why would the, why would the Empire ever fight a battle around Jakku? It doesn't seem like it's an important place. Right. And yet here's a Star Destroyer that crash landed crash. on Jakku. So was there a battle of Jakku? And then why would the Empire expend resources near Jakku? That's... <gasps> maybe, maybe it was a rebel base and they were terraforming it 
because it's like oh it's so inhospitable look at this like humans can't live there okay. but then when the rebels were bail- building a base there they mm-hmm. had to make it livable and but like it was cut the the empire or maybe the the mm-hmm. the new empire what is it called the first order Force? first order thank you the first order maybe they're like ah oh, we see it here let's go attack them okay so I guess you're saying maybe the rebels were putting bases on inhospitable planets, which then Imperial Intelligence figured out. So they send a Star Destroyer or a fleet of Star Destroyers. Somehow they lose to the rebels. Yeah, or at sometimes. Or they lose, lose a Star Destroyer. If you mm-hmm. go to the left, there's also been a ground attack on That's Jakku. Right. How, how important is Jakku? Jakku is somehow super important. Mm-hmm. So I guess this means there needs to be, have been a battle of Jakku during... The rebellion times right that's right because these are not these are not first order actually this is this is the empire style yeah so mm. there's probably some history there i haven't looked up on wikipedia a battle of jakku does that exist you want to look it up let's let's look it up let's see battle of jakku oh hey oh there we go whoa okay was decisive last stand of the Galactic Empire against the New Republic on the surface and above the desert world of Jakku. Due to the final conclusion after a year of prolonged fighting following the Battle of Endor. So this is the last stand on Jakku? How did that happen? What a random location. Okay, wait. I need a, I need a moment to break this down. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> Battle of Endor is when Palpatine dies. Yep. It's when Vader goes down. That's when Luke wins a thing. Mm-hmm. It's, but we're saying that even a year after that, yeah, they are st- the the Empire is still duking it out, yep. and it turns out the Jakku is in the last battle. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Wow. Sound, sounds like we got some reading to do. Damn. Cool. You called you called that. That's, <laughs> that's really cool. Incredible. So stealing. Ray steals BB-8 from this uh, guy riding his mechanical horse. It's a legitimate salvage. Why is Ray stealing it? And why does the guy let Ray steal it? What's going on here? Weird, right? Okay, there she is. She finds BB-8. She's mad. He's mad. Yeah. He's... Go away. She starts ruining his net. Yeah. But it's it's his find. It's his find. It's salvage. Okay, and then he's just like, alright. Like, all right. That means that Ray has a reputation. Tito wants you for parts. Yeah. He's no respect for anyone. I mean, this yeah, is a, it's an inhospitable planet with lots of inhumanity going on. Uh, it's his find. Yeah, he wants to take a BB-8 apart, but it's not like everyone has like huge respect for the sentience of droids. That's right. Um, why? It feels like she has a reputation for violence, and he's like, "Well, That's not right. worth it. Not worth it." Right. He doesn't even like. He does. There's no like back and forth like battle mm-hmm. talking. There's no banter. Or not banter. Right. There's no. There's no like contentiousness. He's just like, "All right, I'm out. Like, I don't. I'm out. I don't want to mess with you, lady." <laughs> like, right. Because he but could it's, have. A, it's his find. He's smaller than her, but like he could have a blaster or something, and just boom. And she's mm-hmm. dead. But he somehow made the calculus is not worth it. Not worth it. She she must be violent. Yeah, I think so. She has some type of reputation where he knows like if she approaches you in the middle of the desert, like you're mm-hmm. vulnerable. Like <laughs> just just leave. Maybe she accidentally uses force on people. And maybe or maybe she's not accidentally, maybe she's naturally figured out how to do mind control stuff. And so people are like, mm, she's that person that's going to talk to you. And you're going to do whatever she wants. Like, yeah. I'll just leave. I'll just, I'll just leave. Just, yeah. Like, I don't want, I don't want to like wake up an hour later and be like, what just happened? Where's the choice? Like, <laughs> I'll just leave. <laughs> I'll just leave. Where is she's running around the desert bullying people? But then when she wants her rations, she is so intimidated. She doesn't know how to bully the ration person. <laughs> he may be an un, un mind controllable people. That's, that's true. Like, there are, there are people, people are. like that in yeah. Star Wars universe. And then Ray is counting the days as they go by since her family mm-hmm. left her in the lurch. But how is this helping? You have to every time you want to like a tally count of the days, you have to count the tallies. Like this is why it. we do that one, two, three, four, five slash. Yeah. And every culture has some kind of system where they do a slash or a grouping. 
-hmm. And then probably you could come up with a system for a larger grouping. So mm -hmm. you don't have to count every tally every time. Like, right. we need to add some slashes and groupings in here. Some. If, if she could really be a machine and space these out perfectly, yeah. then you could say, like, I know the density of slashes. I know the surface yeah. area of this panel. Like, I can calculate it. Yeah. But she clearly doesn't. Like, right. clearly, like, some things are closer than others. Yeah. So she can get an estimate. But if, if she had, like, a panel and there's, like, 100 on the bottom and 50 on the on vertical, 50 mm -hmm. times 100, you know, 5,000. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> but with this varying density, it's only an estimate. It's not precise number but i cut her slack because if she really is like this child of the desert like living out there in no civilization like does she know how to count like who would she learn have learned the tally stuff uh, like that's right where i learned it at school i think actually if she has no formal education this idea of like a number base it's just right because the number base is what you're you get from zero to nine and then you i guess you group guess all finger, the nines fingers are natural yeah though. yeah but she may not have that idea of grouping. So for her, a number is just one additional slash, one additional uh, vertical line. I see. I see. There's no idea of like compressing that into like a digits. number base. Yeah, digits. Right, right. Yeah. Where so without formal education, that's tough. Oh, we just picked on her. <laughs> oh, I feel bad now. <laughs> I mean, it's not saying she's not intelligent it's just if you don't have formal education you have to go back Why? and relearn all the old lessons of math like it's impossible I mean, for an individual to do that yeah i mean it's essentially humans before we figured all this stuff out and then started writing yeah. books to tell the future people like, right i mean how long did it take human civilization to come up with uh like the hindi arabic number system i think it's tens of thousands to a hundred thousand years yeah like it's substantial it's it's and the concept of zero was took hundreds of years like it's not easy Genius i've met level people, people i've met people to now that don't understand zero right i mean i don't understand zero but fuck off that's not true <laughs> <laughs> okay procedures how do how in the world does um poe know the procedures in a tie fighter so gets I in. wanted to fly one of these things. Okay. Use the toggle He's on the left to switch between missiles, cannons, and mag pulse. Use the sled on the right to aim. Triggers to fire. This is very complicated. Okay, so he's, he slides into the TIE fighter and is immediately pressing buttons. There's no, like, hesitation reading panels. No, he knows exactly what buttons to push. Right. And then, not only that, he's able to, in his mind, rotate his, his self, his self, himself, into Finn's position and then tell him how, what buttons to press immediately. So he's got... The paneling and mm -hmm. expertise of both seats in the TIE fighter. That means that the Rebellion is training their pilots to fly X-Wings, who knows what else, and, and TIE fighters in the First Order from yeah. both seats. Yep. So it's not like a gunner and a pilot or, you know, a Wizzo and a pilot, and they're trained up on their own seats. No, they know both positions. They know mm -hmm. both positions so well yeah. that they can help somebody in the other seat. Mm-hmm. That's how well they know it. That, but yeah, and it'll make it even more impressive. He said, I always wanted to fly one of these, which means the Rebel Alliance doesn't have one, or at least at least don't have an operational one, which means these are like, this is like learned from a manual, and then he's like done a bunch of mental reps. Like if I'm facing front, this yeah. is where all the buttons are. If I'm yeah. facing back, these are where all the buttons are. Like impressive. Like super impressive. I mean, it's hard to train people up, and they're, they've got such extensive training that pilots mm -hmm. are trained on the gunner side of a TIE fighter, which they don't even have an operational one of. I mean, right. what are we doing? Wow. Incredible. Incredible intel. And then also incredible dedication to just learn all that stuff. To the craft, to learn all the stuff from the Imperial side, which you're probably never going to use. It's like a waste. Right. right. Oh, my. Gosh, but and you got to do it because if you can capture a TIE fighter, it's so good for the Alliance. But that means you want to, you, all your pilots most of the time are not going to be. No way. Flying TIE fighters, probably. Because like, you don't want pilots captured. being captured. <laughs> like, Poe had to get captured yeah. to get to the access to this TIE fighter. That's right. That's right. So, like, you would put a special T team on it to, like, figure out the intelligence. And if you need it, they train everybody up. But yeah. why waste the time training pilots on the TIE fighters? And it's to the level where it's, like, second nature. They're not like, let me think back to my that one class that I had. It's second it's nature. Like, I mean, right. they just he just knows what buttons he to push it. for those. In this highly sequence. stressful situation, he still just dialed in. He's dialed in. It's incredible. 
what if Poe is just that type of personality? Like he's just has a personality. He's like, like, what are you going to do when you go home today? Like, you know, watch some TV. Like, no, I'm going to study manuals. <laughs> like, I love flying. I love flying so much. <laughs> I'm, I'm not actually going to go home. I'm going to go to the classified space where the Tie Fighter, Broken Tie Fighter, is, and get those reps in. Yep. Because you can't to let you take memorize a, the buttons. Yeah, they're not going to let you take a Tie Fighter manual home, right? Because right. it's they have some sort of secret system, right? It's not just do we do we care about Letting people know that we have, yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't let people know that you have the enemy's plans because the enemy will just change their plans, right? So that you need to you need to capture the enemy stuff, think, and the enemy needs to think you don't have you one. don't have it, right? Because otherwise they just switch the on button with the off button, and then your pilot's like, this won't turn yeah. on, like yeah. it's always off, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so Finn does a bad, bad down on Jakku, he won't shoot, and he doesn't listen to the orders, and Captain Phasma even chastises him, but he's super, he's super rewarded for it. General Hux, is it a resistance pilot? Yes, and he had help from one of our own. We're checking the registers now to identify which stormtrooper it was. The one from the village, FM-2187. So he does bad stuff by not listening to the chain of command. And then here he has Kylo Ren and General Hux, the top two people in the First Order, and they're, they know him by name. Yep. This is incredible. It's a squeaky wheel situation. Right? He, there's millions of stormtroopers dedicating their lives to the First Order mm-hmm. unnoticed. Nobody One knows. little escape, and all of a sudden, your name is being talked at the highest echelons of the First Order. Like wow. on the bridge, the top two commanders, yeah. and then everyone around you hears it. Like you became the most important person by by disobeying. Right. Even if it's in a negative way, like they want to go get you. Talk about you're, you. you're somebody. You're, you're, you're heavy somebody. hitter at this point. Right. There's lots of people here doing high quality work every day. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Just doing your job. So I mean, in summary, if you're at work yep. or on the job, rebel, create yep. a squeaky wheel situation, get your name going up and up and up. Yep. If you're a mailman, maybe you don't deliver mail. Maybe don't deliver mail. Burn it right there. If you if you if you're stocking shelves at Target, maybe you knock everything off. Yeah. They they may the the boss may not like you, but they'll know who you are. They know who Before, you are. Before they didn't have any idea who you were. Right. Right. Hmm. Hmm. Incentives. Hmm. hmm. Mm, that's how things actually work. <laughs> also, the First Order, okay, mm-hmm. they are remnants of the Empire. So they have to be lesser than the Empire. And yet, they have a fully operational Star Destroyer. And Star Destroyer, is this the only one? I doubt it. No, I think they have several of these. Which means you've got the logistics tail of the, the Star Destroyer. Maintenance. I see. Construction. Crewing the thing. Training mm-hmm. facilities. Fueling parts, the thing. Fueling the thing, lubricants. You know, mm-hmm. you're talking a massive institution just to run a Not single easy. star destroyer, which means single. they probably have multiple. So, I I mean, I guess it's galactic scale. So our our thoughts of what big is is all distorted. So this it could be small, even though it's huge on Earth scale. But still, it feels like the first order is pretty damn competent and pretty damn large. Right. Yeah, of of all those different supply chains, if one of them fails, this thing doesn't fly. It so doesn't it, fly. It's all got to work. Yeah, and just the crew. This is a massive yeah. ship. Yeah. This is a well. I mean, how many like thousands several of thousand, people? Several thousand. Yeah. So massive crew all working Heck, together. Damn. Just feeding these people. Logistics That's right. Them. The food and the water on this. Yep. You got to have like supply ships coming in regularly. And entertainment. You can't just have people working all the time. They got to be able to enjoy themselves. Got to give them like an Xbox or whatever, right? So I think of the break room on the Star Destroyer. You could do like simulated. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Damn. Oh, yeah. So uh, on the surface of Jakku, we have Finn runs into um, Ray, and they actually go through quite a few topics of conversation. Let's, Let's listen. Stop it. Where'd you get it? It belongs to his master. It belongs to Poe Dameron. He was captured by the wait, first wait, wait, wait. Ray says that BB-8's master is Poe. Or she doesn't know his name, but she says or, the BB-8 oh. has a master. Why? BB-8 is a sentient being. What is going on in the Star Wars universe where sentient beings have masters? That's uh, Star Wars. Like, yeah, that's... Yeah, I didn't notice it until you, told, you brought this to my attention, but... 
yeah, he's sentient. He makes his own decisions. He does whatever he wants. He, he's like a, a, an individual being, but he has a master. Like, ooh. ooh. And you could that talk to him. Good. You could talk yeah. to him. And yeah. he responds like a sentient being. He shouldn't have a master. He should be an independent person. Now, on Jakku, that makes sense. It's a, it's a planet with lots of problems. Social True. problems probably True. have slavery yeah. and all kinds of things. Yeah. So the fact that Ray is okay with it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. But... That might be a shock to a lot of people from civilized worlds. Yeah. If you go to Coruscant and you're like, here are our slaves. You're like, ooh, ooh gosh. Oof, oof. That doesn't feel good. Yeah. I helped him escape, but her ship crashed. So you're with the Resistance? Obviously. Yes, I am. With the Resistance, yeah. I am with the Resistance. I've never met a Resistance fighter before. Oh, this is what we look like. Some of us. Others look different. BB-8 says he's on a secret mission. So he this is kind of a cute little moment yeah. where he's like trying to act all tough and big. I'm part of the resistance because he we, we've all makes the it. yeah makes yeah. the read that she's impressed by that. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess this romance goes absolutely nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. Tr just from this scene, it kind of makes me feel that Finn likes her. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't yeah. go anywhere. And it doesn't go anywhere. What yeah, a bummer! And actually, and actually, isn't Finn? actually part of the resistance i mean he's not officially like in the resistance but he is now he's done acts that are resistance against the first order resistive he's yeah. helped escape so he and other other troopers escape. have seen yeah. him disobeying orders like yeah. that's that's an attack directly at the first order seeing that so, troopers can disobey and leave like that's bad yeah so he's not officially part of the resistance ranks but it's not such a stretch to say he's now a res he's resistance they're making it sound like he's lying to impress Ray, but I guess keep going. But even if he was, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, good luck, dude. Yeah, 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 try it. Yeah. Try it again. Yeah. Back to your base. Apparently, he has a map that leads to Luke Skywalker, and everyone's after it. Luke Skywalker. I she thought knows. he was a myth. She knows about Luke Skywalker out here. She knows about Luke Skywalker. Like that rumor, which I guess people view it as a rumor now, has got all the way to Jakku. That he's a myth and a force user and interesting. Whatever many decades after it, like after Luke was missing, she still knows about him. Yeah, weird. And I guess it's already 20 years since... Something like that, yeah. Since the Death Star, second Death Star was destroyed and it's already become mythological throughout the galaxy. Luke Skywalker and the Rebellion. I guess that consi is consistent with episode four, but it still seems really fast. Yeah. But I, okay, how can I make it work? So I guess so because during the battle, not many people really knew what happened on the Death Star. So there was the Battle of Endor, which you have lots of troops, and in mm -hmm. the in the Death Star, it was Luke versus Palpatine versus Vader, and mm -hmm. so like people didn't, there weren't many eyewitnesses then, right? I guess I guess a lot of eyewitnesses, but gal galaxy percentage wise, tiny percentage actually right. saw it. So, so even if there were eyewitnesses that saw Luke, like, so first of all, I think there were no eyewitnesses for Luke killing, oh, killing right. so Vader and Palpatine, right? That's so, right. So, so, but, but then, and then Luke comes back to the base and he's like, "Yeah, I killed him." But so then there's plenty of witnesses um, in the Rebel Alliance. But if you're on Coruscant, you're like, "Yeah, I guess this this Empire they say their leader is gone." Mm -hmm. I guess, like, for <laughs> sure, right? Like, I don't care. It's yeah. what happens somewhere else. That's right. So most planets around the galaxy, they're like, oh, the, the, there's, there's chaos at the top. But as far mm -hmm. as my planetary government goes ah, and my sure. life, all I hear is rumor, really. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. That's a good so point. I could see how point. it could become quickly mythological because mm -hmm. there weren't, like, eyewitnesses. It wasn't video recording. Okay. I like that. I like that. Mm. Okay. Still, the speed though, like, and and the fact that she hears about it, even though she's out in the desert somewhere. Okay, so they take the Millennium Falcon, they Ray and and Finn, and Finn tells Ray to get low, get fast, so that the the Tie Fighters don't shoot them. But uh, what? Stay low, guys! Stay low! Stay low! What? Stay low! It confuses their tracking. I'm going low. Good. Okay. Whoa. She gets real low. Real low, like the touch and sand. <laughs> I mean, okay, she so literally why? touched sand. She really uh, kicked up the dust, right? Yeah. Um, but why? Like, why does getting low make the TIE fighters targeting worse? So, as far as I understand with modern military radar, airborne radar, 
Okay, if you're high and the aircraft is low, you got to look down. The aircraft meaning like your target, the target's your tar low? So yeah, there's okay. an aircraft high. You're, you're trying to detect an aircraft low. Okay. If the aircraft's high, you can bounce radar off of it. Okay. And it's surrounded by sky, so all the radar waves go far away. Ah, if, so you're saying that the only only the, the only stuff that is bounced back to you must have hit the plane because there's nothing else around it. Exactly. But if you're I looking see. down, look down radar, right? You're gonna send radio radar out. It's gonna bounce back off the plane, yes, but it's gonna bounce back around off the ground as well. Of, uh, I see. And so that's I guess they call that they call that clutter. Sure. So there's clutter around. So one of the, the adva one of the things they do is they use Doppler effects on the bounce back radar because the ground is stationary but the plane is moving. Okay. But it's still more difficult than looking up. Than just having down. nothing else around it. Yeah. So there are ways around it, as far as I understand, in modern radar. But mm. it is more tricky. It is better to be near the ground. And I guess if you have a stationary station on the ground, being close to the ground, the stationary station just can't look along the Low ground. Low enough. I see. Um, just because there's horizon issues as well, because the Earth Trees is round. And, I see what you're saying, yeah. yeah. But hmm. I'm surprised that a TIE fighter would use a radar system for tracking. Do they use radar, modern type radar for tracking? Yeah, this is the question I had. I have Because it's mm -hmm. totally speculative on my end. Maybe if we check Wikipedia, they have some explanations about what the TIE fighters do. That's, that's um, but true. but um, yeah, I, that was that was similar to what my guess was, but I had no idea if they would use radar. Um, at least their tracking systems behave like radar. Yeah, maybe it's a universal problem. Like even with really advanced tracking, mm. it's just the ground is there mucking up the works. I see. And it's just no matter how advanced you get, that's just an unovercomable problem. There's just other things to track it. But I guess if you in. so if you did like a thermal vision, then you'd have like the heat from the engines versus the warm of the sand. Like that would get mm. around it. So I guess you want like a combined. Yes. Thing. Yeah. So you do all the wavelengths, and because the engine is a spewing IR, you could be like, there it is. Couple that with radar. Couple that with with all the other wavelengths. Maybe you can get a picture. Right. With some probability prob mixing for some weighing for like mm -hmm. like the the radar is very important or the thermal is very important and it's probably going to be yeah yeah. So I guess it's still advantageous to get close to the ground. Because it's still sure. a messier signal no matter what. Yeah. The worst thing you do is fly up in the sky and then the TIE fighter is like, there. Yeah. <laughs> You're, there's yeah. nothing else. Yeah. I guess if you flow, flew close to the sun, you know, you got if you got the enemy aircraft and you fly in between the sun mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the radar and the aircraft, that could cause problems. That would definitely but mess like, up their optical, yeah. But, I mean, if you have multi, how are you going to keep keep that? Keep in line with that. That's not going to happen. You just right. always have to fly towards the sun. <laughs> when you get a turn, like just nope, just fly towards yeah. the sun. It has to be relative to the aircraft as well, and you can't have right. multiple. That's right, because as soon as two tie fighters split apart, now you can't be directly in line with the yeah. sun for both of them. So again, that's still get close to the ground. Yeah. Okay. okay. I like okay. it. Okay. Okay. I guess there's additional additional statement of if you're very high in the air you have a very high gravitational potential energy so when you get low you can get fast and then there's just an additional difficulty that yeah. the tie fighters need to track something faster yeah so ray is a pilot now and she starts out so bad at piloting the millennium falcon which, which I mean, is reasonable like, yeah reasonable she's grinding along the ground she doesn't know all the procedures yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. know how it handles but then she instantly like turns into a master pilot, like doing precise maneuvering. All the quirks of the Millennium Falcon are ironed out. It's incredible. She went from a ma beginner to a master in a matter of 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Let's watch. Ooh. Okay. Okay, Hard crunch, knocking stuff over. Oh, oh, babe. She like skips off the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, now she's into like competence mode right here. You're, you're way up in the air. It's hard to tell if there's like precision flying out. You're in the air. That's fine. Yeah. Then she gets low. Then gets low. <laughs> low, baby. Okay, from here on out there. She's like using the ground to drift. Drifting. Now she's precisely moving between things. Like this. Weaving. Look at this. Look at that precision. If she, she has to know the characteristics of the Millennium Falcon like to a T to get that right. like right. within meters of the wreckage. If it turned, if the Millennium Falcon turned slower than she expected, she would have crashed. She would have crashed. If, if it, it turns, turns tighter, too fast, then she, she could flip the closer. thing around. 
Well, she could have gotten closer. Right. So, so you need to knows. have you need to know like quite precisely the tolerances in which the Millennium yeah. Falcon handle. It gets even worse. Now she's going to go inside a storm, uh, a star destroyer wreckage with all these little tight little spaces, and she's going to do crazy maneuvers. There she goes. I mean, strategically smart. Right. But Got no choice. how? How do you like, know how to do this? this. And this thing, this thing, right there. Oh, look at that. This I'm okay with. But even there, she like knew how much time she had to be in the free float mode. Right. And then exactly when she, the last second when, when to punch she it. Could, when to punch it. And any if she went earlier, she had more time to line up the shot for Finn. If she went any later, she's gonna crash. I see what you're saying. There's there's such a small margin of error. It's not like mm -hmm. she does the flip and then she does a free float and then she's flying with like a huge distance off the ground. Like, no, she had it dialed in. Like she knows right. how this thing flies. Right. And the Millennium Falcon is a piece together thing with yeah. custom yeah. components, you know, Han right. and Chewie putting things on there. So it's gotta have some quirks styled in. It's not like a standard TIE Fighter, like the TIE Fighter A, TIE Fighter B, like they behave the same. Right. It's like this custom thing. So she's, she's just... she's never flown before. She's never flown before. She's just dialed it in. Not a problem. Incredible. Learning curve is just, she's just incredible. Super fast. Incredible. Super, so fast. Whew. Also in this scene, so when they do that flippy thing, mm -hmm. I... Let's watch. Okay, flippy thing? Flippy thing, because the gunner's stuck. Finn shoots it. Yes. She hits the punch stick. Whoa! Isn't that bad situational awareness? Like, the pilot needs to know, like, do I need to keep maneuvering? Like, did the TIE fighter go down? <laughs> but all Finn does is go, woo! Like, shouldn't he say splash? Isn't that isn't right? So, I guess Finn doesn't necessarily know what she's doing. So, she needs to communicate that to him. He yeah. may be like, whatever, I can't do anything at this point. Right. And then all of a sudden, oh, it's lined up. And then yeah. once he hits her, you're saying, well, sorry, once he hits the TIE fighter right. with the blasters, right. he needs to shout a confirmation. Splash, that, splash, splash. Yeah, yeah, I hit the thing. Otherwise, they're in danger again, and they have right. to go back into crazy maneuver mode instead of just leaving the planet. Right. Yeah. What is woo? What is woo? <laughs> yeah, what is woo? <laughs> it sounds positive, but yeah. did you? is that a confirm on the kill? But there's lots of stuff that could have happened that Finn's like, whoa. Yeah, he doesn't see the TIE fighter. He's like, that's an awesome maneuver. Woo! Woo! Still still in pursuit, though. Finn, the word is splash. Is it splash? Is that the right word? I, I, I don't know. I thought you told me this one time. It's like if you time. if you hit, yeah, if an airplane hits another one and it like explodes, I think this is maybe Navy, tech, Navy words, then it's like splash if you actually hit it. And it's a... Something else, I don't, know, I don't know, something else if you miss it, and it's a something else if you hit it but doesn't die, and something like this. Oh, I don't know that terminology. I don't think that was me. That might have been Top Gun. Might or that have been one Top show. Gun. What was that one show, Carrier? Carrier, oh, such a good, yeah, good documentary. Okay, so Ray is a pointer and treating Finn pretty badly. Let's watch. Here's the motivator. Grab me a Harris wrench, check in there. Pilot's driver, hurry. I need the bonding tape, hurry. It's not that one. That place is... No, no. The one I'm pointing to. No, no, no. This? Ooh. Yes. She's so mean. She's so mean. And she's... So, first off, how does she make the mechanical systems in assessment of what exactly is wrong in the Millennium Falcon? I guess that kind of makes sense because she's this scavenger. And so she's interacting yeah. with parts in an inoperable Star Destroyer, though, all right. the time. So, so she's so never actually seen systems work. Well, she, yeah, so inoperable Star Destroyer, and it should be Imperial Tech. I don't know if yeah. its stuff is different for mil, mil, whoever, whatever culture made the Millennium right. Falcon. It's certainly, a, it's an entirely different platform. So one's yeah. Millennium Falcon, one is a Star Destroyer. There may be similar principles at work, but the parts sure. are all going to be probably different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then how does she make the assessment of exactly what she needs? In fact, she makes the assessment so solidly that she's like yelling at Finn for exact parts and things mm -hmm. with confidence. Like she is, there's no way she's wrong. Mm -hmm. hey, what? The, yeah, right. The, Just the absolute certainty is yeah. is confidence at the roof. Yeah, she doesn't come up for a consult, be like, mm -hmm. all right, there's a leak down here. I'm not sure what we need. Can you can you look through those parts over there and see if Gosh, there's anything? She doesn't, 
She doesn't even think through it. She just knows. She just knows. And she knows what they have on hand. Oh. Like, this just looks like a pile of junk. Oh. She knew what was in the <laughs> she knew what tools were in the box. Yeah. How did she, she like, how did she know what tools were there? Well, as she was walking by, she could get a glance down, full assessment. Right. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. To be fair, scavenger. She would be That's constantly true. thinking like worth something, worth something, worth something. It's like constantly assessing. Actually, actually, that's the most realistic part is that she's just looking around at all the parts. I can Being like that. valuable, not valuable. I can skip steal it. That Don't too. worry about it. That's too yeah. heavy, but I could steal it. Yeah. Yeah. But the assessment. And then, and then in addition, she treats Finn pretty poorly. Like it's, he doesn't know the parts that you're, she's asking for. And she's like yelling at him. Yelling. Instead of just trying being like, bring me the box. Like, yeah. <laughs> that would solve yeah. it. Yeah, and don't need to be mean. Don't need, no need to be mean. Also, Finn is a former stormtrooper. Like he is not raised to stand up for himself. He's raised to like get yelled at and do and follow orders, right? Yeah. And and uh, Ray is. I mean, I don't know if it's probably not intentional, but she's really leaning into like, you're wrong, like wrong, wrong, wrong. Do right. this thing, do the thing. You're wrong. Like, oof, brutal. So she's like tearing him down. This is getting yeah. into dicey territory. Yeah, right. and he's I just sh- falling right in line into his scripting. Mm-hmm. The stormtrooper, like someone's yelling at me, like I do right. listen to him and I do whatever they say. Right. Oof. So she may not, she's not doing it intentionally because of her rough upbringing, but that's her. But brutal, brutal. Potentially a setup for our romance, but maybe not. <laughs> oh, so this is uh, on Han's scavenger ship in Star Wars. Just the doors. When you shoot a door, if it the if the plot needs it to open, it opens. If the plot needs it to close, it closes. In this case, when Han shoots the control panel, the door needs to open, so it does. It does. Come on, come on. Wait, did he miss? Interesting. We a, did he? We do a, we do a frame by frame. He missed. He. he shoots there and here here maybe what? there's some ricochet stuff going on okay or maybe shooting here shorts something out there mm-hmm. maybe. what's the status of the control panel after the shot it's intact intact so this is he he was aiming at the control panel hit something else that triggered a door open so i oh gosh i'm okay <laughs> with that maybe like if he shoots here but the wires are back there that mm-hmm. is supplying current or something to hold this mm-hmm. door shut maybe um but, I, the thing i don't like is that you're not guaranteed to like get the thing you like what if he just shot it and then now it's locked forever <laughs> I, mean, I actually think that is the more realistic failure mode is once you destroy the components it's going to continue to be in the state that it was in which closed is a pretty stable state so just be stuck closed from then on. Right. I agree with the caveat of some things are like like switch like electronic switches are normally closed or normally open. So it's like if there's no power running through it, yeah. it, it opens. Or there's another version where it's if you have no power open on it, then it closes. And you just design you design your electronics appropriately for whatever you need. Um, so, yeah. So in that case, maybe I'm okay if the door is one of those vertical doors where it shuts like this mm, and opens. Okay. So if you shoot the panel, it loses power and it just falls. Yeah, exactly. Closed. But, but I guess you could also you can also imagine a door panel that closes vertically, but there's yeah. like a chain with a big old counterweight. So you have mm-hmm. to have power on to push it down. As yeah. soon as you lose power, then the door opens. Mm-hmm. So for this one, what happens? When you shoot it, the door opens. The door opens. Both up and down. Both up and down. Can we watch? So I guess I guess that means that his ship requires power for these doors to be shut, and if you ever power down, then they all open. That's terrible. That's so terrible because you're it's, in space. You're yeah, in, you lose power a little bit on your ship, and everything opens. You vent to space. Everybody's dead. <laughs> no, because this looks. This is circular. This is a circular door yep. that indicates it needs to be able to take pressure stress. Very strong, right? Because you so can't have weak strong. points and corners. You make a circle door. Right. So this means there's probably a bulkhead. So yep. for a bulkhead, you lose power, door opens. This this is terrible. This is... If there was a vacuum on the other side, and all I can do is shoot the panel and it opens, I vent Everyone's my dead. ship. Everyone's dead. Oh, this is even worse than I thought. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. Okay, so, so I, I do not like coincidences in movies, so sometimes they come yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, 
And so the coincidence I'm feeling here is that Ray and Finn take off in the Millennium Falcon. Okay. And then the first people they see are Han and Chewie. Um, and Han okay. and Chewie say that they're scanning the entire galaxy for the Millennium Falcon signals. Okay. Does this make sense? Let's listen. Solo, why are we here again? Get your droid on a clean ship. Clean? You think it was luck that Chewie and I found the Falcon? We can find it on our scanners. The first order is not far behind. So he's saying that the Millennium Falcon is not a clean ship, which means it's detectable from basically anywhere in the galaxy. So yeah. if somebody's looking for it, they can find it based on its unique signature. Okay. So if he knows that, why why not deal with it when you're in the Millennium Falcon? Like turn off. Oh, okay. So, so I guess a couple scenarios. One is that Chewie and Han put a tracker like themselves on the Millennium Falcon because they yeah. were like, we're going to lose it, but we're going to come back for it one day. And the reason they haven't found it until now is because the Millennium Falcon wasn't on. So once it's on, yeah. then the tracker turns on. But if Chewie and Han put the tracker on the Millennium Falcon themselves, then they know about it, which means they can turn it off which means that Millennium Falcon then becomes a clean ship. Um, yeah. Another scenario is that the Millennium Falcon is just trackable, and mm -hmm. which means you need to get rid of it as soon as possible, which means they, they held on to it way too long. Way too long. They need to get rid of it. It's a useless ship at this point. If it's that, like the, the signature is built into the engine somehow, and you'd have mm -hmm. to do a full overhaul, not impossible. Get rid of the ship, dump it somewhere. And if that's true, then why isn't the First Order here already? Because if it's so trackable, then the First Order should get here. And, and how did they beat Han to it? I think the only explanation is that Han and Chewie just happened to be nearby when when um, Finn and Ray left Jakku, which is just a coincidence. Just... Yeah, so even if it is trackable across the galaxy, mm -hmm. there's still travel time. Right. There's still got to get there. It's not just easy to go get. Right. So that means they have to be close and be listening. Right. They're, they're not right. like... You know, sitting in a bath somewhere, right? You know, on a on a, in a hotel, and like, oh, I gotta go. Oh, hey, oh, yeah. So, feels so weird. yeah, feels weird. feels feels weird. Weird coincidence that like the people that need to be here are here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Also, so Finn this is a ex stormtrooper, and he wants to run away. To me, this felt like a great moment of character right great Meaning, motivation makes sense great, makes sense he needs he just wants to get away live life and yeah. he wants to get away from the first order they're after him he wants to go lay low he doesn't want to get caught up in all this rebellion stuff this this makes sense as, as a what motivates finn uh let's watch i was ashamed of what i was but i'm done with the first order i'm never going back ray come with me don't go take care of yourself Please. So it makes sense to me that, so in a in a in a Star Wars movie, it'd be like I want to join the rebellion. I join the rebellion, and I'm the hero. Mm -hmm. But actually, a lot of people would have this mindset of like, I just I just want to check out of this whole situation. It's too much. It's too, it's much. too much. I can't fight the first order. Like they got these yeah. crazy ships. Like I'm out. And I don't think the rebellion is that strong. I'm out. Like, can I go live life? And to me, it makes a lot of sense for Finn to make this move. Like. Mm -hmm. he's, it's not cowardice, it's practicality. Right. And, and it would have been a cool it would have been a cool aspect of his character if he maintained this like constantly like on the edge of like I don't quite believe in the rebellion. Like I yeah. I'm I kinda of, I wanna just get out. Right. I guess it could be a cool twist when he finally starts to believe. Yeah. When you know, with Luke Skywalker showing up or he's raised powers or something, he's like, Okay, okay. Okay. Maybe now I'm, I'm on the team. Yeah. I'm on, yeah. Woo. That would have been a cool it's journey not, for him. But it's not a negative to want to check out. They never, it never felt like this aspect of his character was explored after he got stuck back in the battle. He gets stuck back in the battle and then he's he's 100% in. He's in. He's yep. fully in. Yep. Interesting. Incredible. Just felt yeah. interesting character. Bummer, bummer that yeah. this like very clean and clear and realistic and very plausible motivation for, for Finn and uh, he gets over it just gone gets over it yep so this is another character aspect but this is on ray's side so ray she is uneducated she's a scavenger she's been treated inhumanely her entire life her parents ran away so it makes sense that so if the lightsaber of luke is calling out to ray she's like i don't 
I don't want any of this. I got my family. I've got scavenging to do. Like, this is too much. Can I not do this? This felt realistic to me. So let's watch. That lightsaber was Luke's. It calls to you. The saber. Take it. I'm never touching that thing again. I don't want any part of this. That also yeah, makes I, sense to me. I've got my own life. I'm waiting for my parents to come back. I need to get back that check to get to Jakku. Yeah. And I just, it got weird and creepy. I don't want it. I don't want it. You're telling me some light, this person I just met is telling me some lightsaber is telling me to do stuff like, and it gave me a nightmare or like a waking nightmare. No, thank I, you. I woke up like 10 minutes later. <laughs> like, no, no, I don't want this. Yeah. No, who are you? Yeah. Like, I don't know you. Yeah, that's right. I just <laughs> met you like 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. And then she gets caught up in the battle again and she's in. She's fully she's, in. She's 100% in, yeah. But why isn't this, this aspect feels like it needs to be explored. This like, I don't want to be a part of this. My family, I know they're, deep down I may know that they're not coming back, but I can't just abandon that. It gets worse. And I call it yeah. Deus Ex Gaslight. That lightsaber was Luke's and his father's before him. And okay. now it calls to you. I have to get back to you. Does it? <laughs> the lightsaber yeah. calls for me? Jack, dear it's... child, you already know the truth. Whomever you're waiting for on Jakku, they're never coming back. But there's someone who still could. Look. So oh, Deus shit. Ex Gaslight, like... like <laughs> Ray has her own motivations. She was she's waiting for her parents. She she's like she's this deeply scarred childhood. And then Maz Kanata is like, yeah, but this lightsaber calls you, and there's this person out here, and it could be yeah yeah. You tell me, you tell me. Yeah, it's Luke. Yeah, it's Luke. It's Luke. Go go find Luke. And like it's that's a critical part of the story because she needs to go find Luke. But Maz convinced her into it like mm -hmm. maz gaslighted her like this lightsaber is calling for you mm -hmm. like go find luke because that's what maz wants to happen mm -hmm. is is maz force sensitive did she just did she just mind control ray i don't know but the more i look at maz cannot she seems like this sort of old wise woman mm -hmm. but maybe she's just like master level recruiter and spy master for the rebellion manipulating yeah and when they need when they need an asset and they want to turn somebody or bring somebody into the cause. Send Maz Kanat. She she lowers everybody's defenses, gaslights them to oblivion, and they're on our side now. Woo! And that makes a lot of sense because she owns this like this bar, this cantina yeah. that's like off the beaten path, and it's like mm -hmm. a kind of safe place for people trying to avoid the first order. Like that's the perfect place to recruit people. Yeah. So she could be like high up in the rebellion as like recruiter, spy master. Everybody cut. She, she sees a force sensitive girl and she's like we need her so like, let's, let's she, get it done she sees a force sensitive girl she's like let's sit at this table so that the force sensitive girl sees this hallway she's going to investigate go down yeah. when i see this person goes down like i'm going to let her touch the saber and every person that goes down and touch the saber like you can go find luke go find luke <laughs> she, this is like her script she does it to every person well i mean i guess she would do it to every force user yeah sure sure and then if it's like let's say it's some industrialist she needs to convert she has another script that she runs ah, i see there's like another room like we're gonna sit at this other table so that way they're looking at this this room with a bunch of machines and when an industrialist goes in they're like hey the rebellion needs you you've known it the whole time inside yeah. you yeah so maz cannot could be one of these like anti-heroes of the rebellion this like thing that okay. we don't like to do but gotta do it gotta do it because it's that or the first order it's that or the first order hey I can get by war, that. War, war sucks sometimes, you know? War sucks. Got to do what you do. Do we take care of this broken teenager or do we just recruit her and use her and or, spit her back out again? I mean, a gaslight to save the galaxy? Heck yeah. To save the galaxy. Yeah. yeah, save the galaxy. Save the galaxy. 